Once again, welcome to Summit. In the event you missed us last week, or if you fell asleep during the message, last Sunday we took a look at what appears to be a boring infomercial in between the death of the firstborn son and the crossing of the Red Sea. Here in this dull stretch between two epic events, the Lord instructs Moses related to things like circumcision, unleavened bread, and the consecration of the firstborn of both man and beast. What does this have to do with Exodus, and why tell us here and now? The crux of this passage is dependent upon recognizing that the Lord has just liberated a people group steeped in Egyptian culture and Egyptian slavery for 400 years. The Lord had just emancipated the people in the previous text, and now he is constituting his people, orienting them to a new king and kingdom. When we see the instruction in its proper context, we see that the new instruction is not given arbitrarily, but is in direct response to the instruction previously given by Pharaoh. Whereas Pharaoh's citizens were accepted based on their race, Yahweh's citizens are accepted based on faith. Whereas Pharaoh's kingdom demanded bricks without straw, Yahweh's kingdom demanded bread without leaven. One required twice as much time and energy, the other demanded half. Whereas Pharaoh never gave the people a day off for 400 years, Yahweh will begin the Israelites' year with paid time off and vacation. Whereas Pharaoh tore the family apart, Yahweh insists on bringing the family together. Whereas Pharaoh took all the spoils of the Israelites' labor, the Lord shares the spoils of their labor and empowers them to be good stewards of it. At the end of the passage, it becomes clear to see that in this relatively boring passage, the Lord is setting a clear contrast between his kingdom and Pharaoh's. The Lord's kingdom will give life, whereas Pharaoh's kingdom will take it. The question of the text was, who is your king? And what does it look like to be a part of his kingdom? Today, we will continue in the story by taking a look at the crossing of the Red Sea. If you have your Bibles, flip on over to Exodus 14. Let's pray. Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Lord, we ask that you come and join us, come guide our conversation, come pour out your mercy upon our heads that we might see you for who you are, treasure you above all things. Uh, Teach us through this, um, well, maybe I'll say uh, to a certain extent, a fun text for me this week, Lord, uh, for us this morning. um, Come and guide us as you so see fit. To Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, if you've been with us at Summit, you'll recall that uh, over the past couple months, we've been in the book of Exodus. Now, most recently, we have um, been taking a look at the plagues and the Passover. We've been taking a look at, uh, last week was a super boring passage. This week, we're jumping into the crossing of the Red Sea, and it's super exciting again, so I'm really pumped. Um, Sorry, I've been a little, Jen, we're doing good? All right, we're good. No, I don't know, I'm just blinking here, so that's the only reason I'm thinking. It might not be picking up audio. That's the only thing I'm thinking. So, yeah, you, you, sounds good. All right, sorry for embarrassing you and myself. I'll pay for that later, but that's okay. All right, I'm focused now. I'm driven, we're dialed in. We're having some audio issues, but we should be, we should be pretty good. I'm gonna start over. Does that work well? Here we go. Good morning and welcome to Summit. My name is David Pendleton. It's a pleasure having you with us. Uh, if you've been with us for the past couple of months, you'll recall we've been in the book of Exodus, most recently been in the plagues, and then we took a look at the Passover. And now we're about to head to the crossing of the Red Sea, and with the exception of the really boring passage we took a look at last week, we're now back in the action, and it's super exciting. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was an Israelite who just saw God do all these incredible Incredible things on behalf of me and my people. I'd be looking forward to getting out of Egypt and heading back to the land of promise, to the promised land in the land of Israel, or at the time labeled as Canaan. I'd be super excited. Because I don't know about you. I'd be thinking, man, this is going to be an awesome trip because look at what God just did. So clearly this trip is going to be smooth sailing. It's going to be quick, fast, and easy, because look at the God that we follow, look at the God that we serve, look at how he's already led us, now we head into the wilderness, we're going to hop on a conveyor belt, he's going to have a 747 waiting for us, we're going to just take a first class flight to the land of Canaan. Is that how it works out? Is that what happens? 
But there's only one way to find out. If you got your Bibles, let's take a look at this text to see how the Lord leads the Israelites on the first day or series of days in back to the land of promise, back to the land of Israel. It begins in 13.7. It reads like this. <clears throat> now when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sakath and encamped at Etam, on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them, by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Chapter 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in the front of pi hai Hithroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of baal Sephon, Sephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants changed toward the people. And they said, what is this that we've done? That we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out. Finally, the Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen and his army, and, and overtook them and encamped, and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pihahira in front of but all seven. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said when we were back in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you, only, you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was a cloud of, and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming ne near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea and dry ground. The waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, and in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and the pillar and the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily and the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians. 
upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into the chariot, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and, all, and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground and through the sea. Walked on dry ground through the sea. The waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and saw and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the sea. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord, and in his servant Moses. Imagine for a moment that you are an Israelite who has been mightily saved and delivered by the Lord through a series of incredible, miraculous wondrous place. And now it's day one where quite literally Pharaoh has said, I don't care where you go, just get out of here. And the Egyptians are coming to the people in the street and giving them silver and gold and clothes and saying, I beg you, please leave. Imagine what the Israelites were thinking was up ahead of them. We've got this God on our side leading us back to the land of Canaan, to the land of promise. Surely this trip is going to be smooth sailing, nice and easy going. It's going to be swift, fast, easy, and joyful. And then we read today's text. Now, before we talk about how the Lord leads them back to the promised land, we need to talk a little bit about where the Lord leads them. And I'll warn you now, you're going to be dissatisfied with our conclusion because, well, we don't really, can't really draw one. In this text, it does give us a number of different towns that they pass through or by, and it obviously tells us that they crossed through the Red Sea. So our big question is, because it's giving us all this geographical information, where in the world is, uh, where in the world did they cross? Where in the world did they go? And ultimately, as you're going to see in just a moment, um, we don't fully know. And here's why. Because a handful of the different cities that are mentioned within this text, such as Ethium, uh, we don't know where that is because it's been about roughly 4,000 years since this event happened, and that city that we're aware of no longer exists, or it exists under a different name, and so we're not 100% sure exactly where they went. So I'll tell you roughly what we think we might know and what we don't know, and then we'll get past the where the Israelites went and we'll get to how they went out. Is that fair? All right, so the first thing we see in this text is that they were hanging out in the land of Ramses, which is roughly right around here. If you guys remember, the Israelites were originally given the land of Goshen, which is up here, it's a very fertile part. That's one of the little outlets of the Nile right up here. And the Israelites were hanging out in the land of Goshen. They were serving the land of Ramses. And so we think originally when the Exodus happened, they're kind of coming around through this area. And that's about all we know, okay? This is where they start. And then the text tells us that the Lord wants to, if you didn't know, this is the promised land. This is a modern day map. So I got Israel right here. You might be familiar that this is the land of Jordan. Uh, this is Saudi Arabia. This is what we refer to as the Sinai Peninsula. And this is Egypt right here. Uh, the Lord is eventually going to be leading them into the promised land, the land of Israel, which at this point is referred to as the land of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and the Perizzites. But that's where they're going. This is where they are. What makes the most sense? It makes the most sense for the Lord to lead the people right along the Oceanic Highway, like Highway 101, right here to the land of Israel. But the first thing we're told is that that's not what the Lord does or wants to do with people lest they interact with the Philistines, literally Philistines mean people of the sea, lest the Philistines attack them, that they see war and they come running back to Egypt. So what we see the Lord doing is it says that he leads him down or south into the wilderness. Now the question that we have is how far south? Um, it could be that he's leading them, well, it says that he leads them down into the wilderness. Is it talking about this wilderness right here? Is it talking about this wilderness right here? Or is it talking about what will eventually be this wilderness over here, also known as the land of Midian? We're not really sure. We're told that they go to a city named Ethium, another one that I can't pronounce, as you can tell. It's like Tihai Hadharoth or something like that. We don't know where those things are. So we're not quite sure what path they went. In addition to that, we're not quite sure what body of water they crossed over either, for this reason right here. This is the Red Sea. As you might be aware, this is the uh, Gulf of Suez. This is the Gulf of Aqaba. Today, we know this area because of the Suez Canal. There was a trench that was dug to connect the Mediterranean Sea with the Red Sea here. So this is actually a modern rendering of the map where normally this line would not be there, but I wanted to show a distinction between Egypt and 
the Sinai Peninsula. Um, our question is, where did they cross? Because the Israelites referred to this, they didn't call it the Gulf, Gulf of Suez, they referred to it as the Red Sea because it's indeed attached to it. They did the same with this over here. This was also the Red Sea. Now something that makes this even a little more tricky is, uh, is the word used in Hebrew to describe the Red Sea. It's the word Yam Suaf, uh, or Suf Yam. Uh, and that is, in Hebrew it's ref it says Red Sea, but the origins to that word come from an Egyptian word where they don't define that word as red, they define it as reed. And so sometimes people say, well, it could be the Reed Sea. And the difference between the Reed Sea and the Red Sea is when they're referring to a Reed Sea, they're mentioning that reeds, namely, grow in fresh water, not salt, salt water. And so there's a belief that it could be that the Egyptians, are, or sorry, the Israelites are crossing a body of water called the Reed Sea somewhere in this region where there, once were, a bar, where there were a bunch of lakes that have been since turned into uh, effectively the Suez Canal. Um, why is that an okay reading? Because you would hear, no, it says, even if it's read C, it's still C. And when we think C, we think salt water. But in Hebrew, this is interesting, they do not make a distinction when they're calling a body of water something. We say C if it's got salt in it, lake if it doesn't. They say C regardless. It's kind of like in the New Testament, if you remember, I think it's um, the Sea of Tiberias and the Lake of Galilee are considered the same body of water. It's a lake and it's a sea because in their mind there was no distinction between salt water and fresh water. We say sea, lake, they say body of water. Could be salty, could be not salty. You guys tracking with me? To make a long story short, if you're not tracking with me, we don't know where in the heck they cross. I have a tendency, kind of like Jenna said last night, she said, well, that's not really epic if all they did was cross a lake, and I agree with that. So I have a tendency not to lean towards the Reed Sea uh, methodology because once you get to the Septuagint, which is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew text, they're describing it very specifically as the Red Sea. They're using the name that describes these bodies of water right here. Not to mention by the time you get to the New Testament and it describes the event, it's describing in Greek the Red Sea, not the Lake of Reeds which is why I lean away from that, but you're going to find a lot of that in the literature if you look over these things, people talking about some type of fresh body of water right around here. So we don't know where they crossed, if you can't tell at this point. I'll tell you where Dave stands, which means nothing at all. It probably just means it's more wrong than other things, but here we go. I have a tendency to think that they were actually maybe crossing over this way. Reason being is, do you remember, the Lord says to Moses when he finds him in the land of Midian, one thing we do know is the land of Midian is right around here. Um, and Moses, if you remember back in Exodus 3, 4, and 5, this is where he was when the Lord found him. If you remember specifically, he was grazing his sheep. Now it's very possible for Moses to take his sheep to grazing grounds around yonder, where he then interacts with the Lord on Mount Sinai. And the Lord says to him when he's on Mount Sinai, I'm going to bring your people back here to Mount Sinai. I just have a tendency to think that it's Mount Sinai is going to be somewhere near Midian, and I've got a feeling that with this whole thing, the Lord is bringing them into the land of Midian through the uh, Gulf of Aqaba right over this way. I don't know for sure. That's just Dave's personal thoughts. Um, you can YouTube it. There's some interesting theories out there. But one thing I found is no one has 100% certainty and 100% confidence on where they crossed over because, quite literally, their tracks were covered by the ocean. Uh, one thing I do know is they crossed a substantial body of water with walls on either side, and everybody who was there said, this is miraculous, this is not some natural event, and everybody who heard about it knew it was miraculous because by the time the Israelites roll up in the land of Israel, people are petrified because of the fact that they crossed through the Red Sea and they crossed through the Jordan River. This is unheard of. Does this make sense? Um, I cover all that because the text mentions all that, and you might want to know where we're at. I'm going to be pretending for the rest of the service that they were wandering around in here and that they're going to be crossing the body of water that I can't prove that. Um, that's kind of just what I'm going to be doing for the sake of the story. That's about where they're crossing in the Red Sea. Much more important than that is how they cross. What's going on in their journey between Egypt and eventually Israel. That's what I want to draw your attention to. Because if you're anything like me, I would have assumed that the Lord just would have taken them yoink, right up here on the fast track up to the land of Israel. But if anything is proven in the text, it's that the Lord decided to not do that. In fact, 
if I were in Israel, the first thing I'd note about what the Lord was doing is I would say this escape plan that he's hatched up is incredibly inefficient. Look at this. I mean, I'd be the one Israel. I mean, maybe it'd just be me, and you'd be content with the Lord, you know, taking us the long route. But here we go. We can have a seaside retreat, Lord, on our way back to Israel. It's going to be fast. It's going to be smooth. It's going to be good. And the Lord says, no, instead of taking you the short, fast way, I'm going to take you the long, treacherous, painful way through the Sinai Peninsula. If you are curious about the Sinai Peninsula, curiously enough, another thing I know about this map is Patrick Patterson spent an ample amount of time here when he was stationed for the National Guard, I don't know, protecting, well, making sure that Israel and Egypt still got along. He was hanging out here, and he's got all sorts of fun stories about this area. But one thing I know about it is, though he says it's beautiful in like a weird, deserty, twisted way, it's not, it's like a very barren land. So the Lord is saying, hey, instead of taking you uh, by the sea, where it's going to be efficient, it's going to be short, it's going to be fast, I'm going to take you through the wilderness where it's hard, where it's difficult, where the sun is going to be beating down on you effectively. The first thing we observe about what the Lord is doing is he is not taking them efficiently. He's leading them very, very inefficiently. The second thing, did you see this in the text? At one point, as the Lord is, again, I'm going to pretend that they're walking through this area, the Lord is leading them this way. At some point, he tells the Israelite people, hey, I want you guys to turn around and retrace your steps. Go back the other way effectively start heading back to the land of Egypt. Now, if there's anything that rattles my cookie jar more than anything else, it's when I am having to do one step forward, ten, step back, ten steps back. If we're going on a, on a picnic as a family, we hop in the car, we get all the kids strapped in and buckled down, and we leave, and we find out even 30 seconds from leaving the house that we left the food back at the house, I say, who cares? We'll go sit on a picnic blanket and just talk about our feelings. We are not going back because I cannot handle retracing my steps. And here the Lord is roughly leading, what, 2.5 million people through the wilderness? They're going out this way, and then God says, hey, i got a great idea. How about you turn around and go the other way for a little while? I would be so angry at this point. I would be furious because the Lord is leading me. And one thing I would observe about this is the way in which he's leading me appears to be incredibly unproductive. He's not taking me the short way. He's taking me the long, terrible way. In addition to that, he doesn't know where he's going because we were here two weeks ago. You see what I'm saying? Oh, it would be roasting my cookies. I don't care. It'd be very difficult to follow. But that's not all. What we see happens in this story is Pharaoh, likely via spies and messengers, sees that the Israelites don't know where in the heck they're going. He literally sees that this people is just meandering through here. He's like, why didn't they go there? Clearly in slave class, they never took a geography lesson. They're just meandering down this way. Surely there are like a, um, a their lost sheep that needs a shepherd. I'm going to go, and I'm going to master them again. So what does he do? He summons his entire army to go and pursue the Israelites, making the situation that the Lord is leading the Israelites through incredibly precarious and incredibly dangerous and terrifying. Oh, we're falling apart here, gang. All right, we knew this would happen. Here we go. You know, you're saying, Dave, why didn't you learn your lesson from last week? Because they were falling last week. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. But again, I'm being unproductive, okay? And inefficient. No. Oh, brother. I actually ironed these, too, and they did not, they're deciding not to stay. All right, not only is this incredibly unproductive, this lesson is incredibly unproductive, but what the Lord is doing is as he's leading them through the wilderness, it's incredibly dangerous. He's leading them through the wilderness. What provisions do the Israelites currently have on them? They got extra clothes, they got gold and silver. What is that going to do for them when they're in a hot wilderness looking for water, looking for food, and now Pharaoh is hotly pursuing them? So eventually, the pillar in the cloud, um, this is where I'm making, again, I'm imposing my thoughts on where they went just for the sake of argument. This is where the pillar and cloud now, as Pharaoh is pursuing them, the Lord leads them to a giant body of water that they cannot cross over. 
It's not like they can even borrow the Philistine ships here and hop over this bad boy. There's nothing out here. Ask Patrick Patterson. There's nothing out here, just a big body of water. Now they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. They've got Pharaoh behind them, and they wall a body of water in front of them, and they look at Moses and say, this is absolutely hopeless. And then they say to him, what we've laughed at before, they say, what? Were there no graves back in Egypt? So you brought us out here to bury us? Basically, they're saying, what? There weren't enough pyramids to hold us all? So you want to kill us out here? Thanks, babe. What the Israelites are doing, if you want to start with one, you can start with unproductive. Um, ironically. Uh, what the Israelites are doing is the Lord has led them between a rock and a hard place, and they are absolutely, I'm going to guess on this one, babe. You can rearrange me if you want. They're absolutely petrified. And what I mean by that is they're literally stunned into fear, where they quite literally cannot move. If we go back, Pharaoh kills us. If we go forward, we drown. The Lord has brought them. This is where the Lord has led them, to be absolutely petrified. And the last thing we see is the Lord says, okay, I've got a solution for you. Moses, go ahead and walk over to the water, wave your staff over the water, and the waters are going to split in two. Now, this is the fun part for me. Because I used to think that this would be a really cool moment if you're an Israelite. Because like, we are, what are we going to do? When are we, he's going to kill us, we're going to die. And all of a sudden the water's like, oh, right? And I usually think, like, whoa, that's awesome. That's salvation. Honey, let's go, right? Grab the kids and let's go through. Have you ever thought about this? How what that thing looked like? Looked like an absolute death trap. Who here, with the exception of, you're going to say, oh, I've seen ice crystals do this. Who here has ever seen water stay in the form of a wall, perpetually, unless you walk past it? Anybody? That's not what water does. This is incredibly uh, unnatural, incredibly irrational. Another way to put it would be, this thing is incredibly Illogical. Jim, I love you. This is why I married you. Right here. Thank you. Look at that. She is so efficient and so productive. And I'm petrified of contradicting her because that's dangerous. I'm trying to be logical. Okay, I see how I do that. Thanks, babe. Love you. I used to think that this is a solution. Sweet. Pharaoh's behind us. There's a wall of water. There's water in front of us. Oh no, we're all going to die. And they're just trembling in fear, basically insulting Moses and insulting God. And all of a sudden, God says, Okay, Moses, I got a great idea. Part the waters. They split in two. I would have looked at that and said, No way, Jose. I'd rather die by Pharaoh. Does this make sense? This is a death trap. Water doesn't hold itself in walls. It is the Lord literally then saying, Okay, now go. It is incredibly illogical to follow the Lord through those waters. And now we learn, and the Israelites learn, within their first few days, weeks, month or so, of following the Lord, what it is to follow the Lord. We would think it's going to be fast, easy, streamlined, comfortable. It's going to make sense to us. And what the story proves to the Israelites from day one, week one, month one is following the Lord oftentimes looks incredibly inefficient, wonderfully unproductive, terribly dangerous, horrifically petrified, and absolutely illogical. Nothing he is calling them to do or nowhere that he is leading them to be makes any sense at all. And that is what the Lord wants to teach them from the very beginning. This is what it is to follow me. What are we supposed to learn from that? What are some blessings that we can glean? Uh, another way of saying is, why is the Lord doing this? Why? Lord, I would have pulled out a map and just said, look, we can go there. Even if you want us to dip through the water, we can go right back up here. Listen, even if you want us to wander through the wilderness, we don't need to keep retracing our steps. Just take us there. That's where you're taking us. You don't need to put us between a rock and a hard place. You need to get us separated by water. So at least lead us over here. Bring us across the Jordan. Do something other than what you're doing because what you're doing is killing us. If we follow you, we're going to die. This doesn't make any sense. So why is the Lord doing it? There are a few things we can learn. One of the first things we can learn is this. 
the Lord is establishing for his people what he is going, what he has already established in Genesis, and what he's going to continue to unpack moving forward throughout the rest of the book. But he's establishing this: that the Lord is holy. I don't know about you, but when I first say the Lord is holy related to this text, I'm like, I don't see it. Because usually when I think of holy, I think of like pure, I think of clean, I think of sinless. But a proper understanding of the word holy is actually the word unique. Another way in which we sometimes reference it is set apart. What the Lord is doing to his people is he is communicating to them through this series of horribly terrific ideas and events that he is unbelievably holy, unbelievably unique and set apart. How? Because every other king and every other kingdom leading any other group of citizens has to be bound by geography, has to be bound by bodies of water, has to be bound by people and resources, and the Lord is saying, no, we're going to go in the opposite direction, the nonsensical direction. I'm going to lead you into the worst way possible to show you that I am supreme over all those things, and I can deliver you out of absolutely anything. Pharaoh, if he were leading you, he'd have to go this way, because he can't survive in the wilderness. I made the wilderness. It bows at my feet. I, I snap at the water. It goes up. I am absolutely unique and holy. There is nothing, no one else like me. I'll take you the long way. Where everyone else would die. Because no one else can do it. I'm the Lord. I'm holy. I'm unique. You just trust me. Follow my lead. Does that make sense? The Lord is doing an incredible work in this text. And the fact that he is making himself distinct from any other king running any other kingdom. He doesn't need to do common sense type things because he is not logical. He's not natural. He's not rational. He is super logical, supernatural, super rational. He's above it all. That's why he's doing this. I am holy. I am unique. You're going to learn from me as I lead you through a series of terribly horrific, wonderful events that I'm above and beyond all. That makes sense? That's the first reason he's doing it. The second reason he's doing it is we see through this series of unfortunate events that you notice this? The Lord is, it's as if he's intentionally stacking the odd against himself. Yeah, we might be able to survive if we quickly run across here and try and avoid the Philistines, which the Lord could have easily done. Instead, I'm going to bring you down here. He literally, did you notice this? The Lord says to Moses, I'm going to bring you back so that will fish Pharaoh out of his hole so that he'll come and attack you. I mean, imagine this conversation between Moses and God saying, God, that's a bat. You're bringing us back just so that he'll come out to try and hunt us down? He's got chariots, which in our day and age, we're like, ooh, big deal, chariots. Chariots were the tank of the day back then. He's got chariots. He's got horses. He's got men. We're Jewish. We've got flint knives and shepherd staffs. What are we going to do against Pharaoh? The Lord is intentionally stacking the odds against himself by putting them between a rock and a hard place. There's no other place we could go. And you've got to ask the question, why is the Lord doing that? Why is he intentionally stacking the odds against them? Why is he intentionally stacking the odds against himself? For this reason right here. He is dismantling the Israelites' hope, faith, trust in anything other than himself. If the Israelites were to escape from Egypt and go to Israel via the sea, they could say, yeah, once God got us free, it was our job to run as quickly as possible into Israel, and that's exactly what we did. Even when the Lord wanted to bring us down into the wilderness, we figured out how to navigate and get back to the promised land. We Israelites are awesome. Even when the Lord brought us here in front of the sea and Pharaoh faced us down, we picked up our flint knives and our shepherd's staff and by our hand and by our might we went and we conquered the, Pharaoh, the Egyptians and ran back up to the promised land. If at any given moment the Lord is not consistently stacking the odds against the Israelites to where they become utterly hopeless, saying what? We didn't have room in the pyramids to bury us? You brought us out here? We're dead, Moses. We are utterly, forgive my language, we're utterly screwed. There is no hope. We are dead out here. And that's when the Lord says, now watch me work. Literally, Moses says to him, you don't have to do anything but stand still. Watch God save you today. And the Egyptians you see now, you will never see again. They will no longer plague you. The Lord is intentionally stacking the odds against them and against himself so that when he comes to deliver them, no Israelite at the end of the day can pat themselves on the back and say, 
Look at how awesome I am. Look at how I escaped from Egypt to Israel. Um, I've seen this play out in my life. I saw it play out last night. If you've been up at the church, you might have seen this at the back of the church. There is a 55-gallon um, drum lid in the back of the church parking lot right now. And last night, Jenna looks at it because it's a weird thing out there. She's like, what's that for? I said, oh, 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 oh. your boy Dave, that's me. Got uh, acquired a 55-gallon oil drum. This is Wild County. You guys know what that is, right? And if you know anything about those, I wanted to use it as a burn barrel, but the top was welded on. You guys know how this works? I now know how it works. Look at me. So I wanted to use this as a burn barrel. How do I get the lid off? Well, YouTube, it's no big deal. And I realized using an angle grinder, you like use that thing as a can opener on the top, and you grind away at the top, hoping that you don't die somehow. You grind it off, and then you punch it down, and it goes, and you get a barrel. So Jenna's asking me, where'd that lid come from? And I wax eloquently into this incredible story about how well they, you know, I'm kind of thrifty and I'm cheap. Uh, and I found this drum and it's given to me, and so, you know, I, I YouTubed it, you know. I used an angle grinder and I was shooting sparks, and I was like, oh, defying death and gravity and reality and all sorts of things as I was, you know, getting through this thing, and at the end I just punched through and it was awesome, and that's how I'm providing for our family, you know, like, that's what I do. It's really funny, because she didn't hear any of that, because the truck was too loud and she was by us, so she said, what'd you say? And that was like the Lord saying, what'd you say, Dave? Because let me, this is the Lord saying it to me, let me recall for you the events of that situation. You were freaking out when you first got that thing because you're holding an angle grinder, which John Dundas told me, that's the most dangerous tool you can ever operate because the little shards are going to slide off and slash your throat open, is what he told me. So the entire time, I got like all sorts of protective gear on, and I'm basically crying behind this wheel like, Lord, don't let me die, don't let me die, don't let me die, I don't want to die, I can't die like this. Like, if I die, the whole church is going to make fun of me for dying in a construction accident. Like, please, don't let me die, don't let me die. And I'm crying and praying, and I wasn't able to punch the thing through like the YouTube video said I could. I had to get them out and just whack on the thing, and the thing looked really ugly by the whole time the thing was said and done. It was a terrible ordeal. But when I'm retelling that event, I'm not telling my wife about how I was pleading with the Lord to have mercy on my soul so that it didn't die. Instead, I'm bragging and saying, well, babe, let me tell you, I'm really a man, you know? I do manly things with angle grinding and there were sparks flying and all that stuff, but I wasn't afraid at all when the Lord's like, you were petrified the entire time. You nearly cried over this little project. YouTube said it would take two minutes. It took you two hours. Don't do this, Dave. You needed me this whole time. Does this make sense? Unless the Lord stacks the odds against the Israelites, and drives out all hope in themselves or anything else, they will not see that it was the Lord at the end of the day who delivered them. Um, we're going to see, uh, Miss Jenny, I don't know if you could throw up that Deuteronomy verse. Um, we're going to see that the Lord is stacking the odds against uh, himself and against them, so that at the end of the day, it is unequivocally clear that the Lord is the one who saved Israel. They literally were standing still when God came. To deliver. Does this make sense? The other thing, what else does this showcase? This not only showcases the holiness of God, this also showcases the unholiness of Israel. Because what's the first thing coming out of the mouth as soon as these things add up and they realize, wait a minute, we could have gone this way, we have been going this way, and now we're about to die. What do they do? They get in God's face, saying, you're a cruel master, you're a wicked king, send us back to the land of Egypt. At least there, that king didn't kill us, even though he did. At least that king there cared more about us than you do. What the Lord does is he drives them to a point. To um, The Lord knew it was in their hearts all along, but the Lord drives them to a point where he actually brings it out of their mouth so that they can see who they are. The Lord is incredibly holy. The Israelites in this text are unbelievably unholy. I don't know about you, but the Lord has done this in my life as well. He's stacked up events to where I get to a breaking point, to where he reveals what's going on in my heart via my mouth when all of a sudden I yell at him in opposition and frustration. When he's leading me, when I, I'm, Lord, I'm following you, but you're being incredibly inefficient, you're being incredibly unproductive. This is dangerous and this is scary for me, Lord, and this does not make any sense. And eventually I get to my breaking point and I get in his face and I say, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know where you're leading me, you have no idea what you're doing, and I'm done following you. And I don't know about you, but typically in those moments, I expect the wrath of God to be poured out on my head but you know what usually happens? That's generally speaking when the waters begin to part in my life. When all of a sudden God says, okay, Dave, now that you know who I am, now that you know who you are, 
and you're completely undeserving of me saving you, watch this, I'm going to save you. You guys ever have this happen? There have been times where I've gotten in the Lord's face only for him to then say, finally, I got you where I want you. Because, Dave, I'm revealing to you what was in your heart all along. You didn't want to follow me. You wanted to go up here to the promised land. And you wanted me to be your escort to get you to some greater land, Dave. But I've not come to lead you to a place. I've come to lead you to myself. And now, through this whole series of unfortunate events, I'm demonstrating what was in your heart all along. This is what the Lord is later going to say to the Israelites in the um, next passage, Miss Jenny, if you don't mind, in Deuteronomy. He's going to say to them, Know therefore, he's talking to Israel, that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord to get your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. The Lord is allowing this series of unfortunate events to show Israel not only who he is, but who they are, and how they are absolutely, completely undeserving of him coming and saving them. Does that make sense? They're not Israelites. They're Egyptian slaves. They'd rather be under the purview of Pharaoh back in Egypt. They want nothing to do with him. They're not saved because they're righteous. They're actually saved because they're unrighteous, and God wants to show how gracious he is to an unrighteous group of people. Does this make sense? So the Lord oftentimes will lead you and me very inefficiently, very unproductively. What we perceive to be very dangerously causes great fear and illogically, not only to reveal who he is and his saving power, but to reveal who we are and how unworthy of being saved we actually are. And it typically only comes to fruition once you get in his face and say, I never trusted you all along. He says, my point exactly. Now watch me work. Does this make sense? The Israelites are not saved because they're better than the Egyptians. If anything, the Lord's going to say later on, you are worse than the Egyptians themselves. I'm saving you because of who I am, not because of who you are. I'm saving you because I'm gracious, not because you're deserving. Does that make sense? And then the last thing <clears throat> that we see in this text is that, curiously enough, the Israelites had been perceiving that the Lord had been bringing them, uh, leading them very inefficiently, unproductively, dangerous, petrifyingly, and illogically, only until... They thought this up until all of a sudden they turned around and as the Egyptians are hotly pursuing them, all of a sudden they watch the Lord snap his fingers and the water comes back like this and flushes out the Egyptians. And in that moment, after criticizing the Lord the whole way through the wilderness, all of a sudden they realize, wait a minute, he had been leading us incredibly efficiently. That was wonderfully productive. It wasn't dangerous ever for even half a millisecond because he was with us and he was leading us. We didn't need to be still because we were petrified. We needed to be still because God was fighting on our behalf. And it wasn't that that thing was illogical. It was <coughs> supra-logical. It wasn't unnatural. It was supernatural. We should have trusted him all along. And it's only after the waters come back over the Egyptians that, they, that the Israelites realize all their criticisms against the Lord are completely unjustified. Because what the Lord did that day was actually incredibly efficient, wonderfully productive. It uh, wasn't dangerous for them at all. They didn't need to be terrified or fearful. And it wasn't illogical because in one day, the Lord broke the stranglehold of the Egyptians over the Israelites. 400 years of slavery were gone in an instant as the waters collapsed on the Egyptians. And for the most part, the Israelites have never seen since that day the Egyptians as a major threat to their existence. Crazy. They were criticizing the Lord the entire time. You don't know what you're doing. This is stupid. Let us drive a car, move over, get out of the way, only for him to deliver them, for them to say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like Job, I put my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once, but I will speak no more. Does this make sense? And I don't know about you. But the times and the seasons in which I've accused the Lord of leading me in the exact same way, by the time he's brought me all the way through whatever he wants to bring me through, I look back and say, my Lord and my God, there is no one like you. I dare not utter a peep against you because you know exactly what you're doing. In fact, that's the theme of this story. From Isaiah 55, the Lord is going to say this. This is um, the theme of the text. It's so important. I'm going to roll this thing out of the way so that you guys over here can see it. 
the Lord will one day say to his people, say to the Israelites in Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Namely, specifically what he's saying in this text is, I'm God, you're man, you can trust me, even when it doesn't make any sense to you. I am here, you are way, way down here, all you need to do is trust my instruction and watch me work. And we up, what do we do? Like the Israelites, we gripe, moan, complain, and criticize the entire time, and yet even still, he is gracious and faithful to deliver us while we're kicking and screaming, following him throughout the wilderness that we don't understand. Does this make sense? There's one thing that's lost on the Israelites. The Israelites think that the Lord has come to deliver them to a place and so they criticize him accordingly of, hey, you're not getting us there as quickly as possible. But they're misunderstanding that the Lord has not primarily come to bring them to a place or to you to some place. He's come to bring them to himself. And if the Israelites were seeing the Lord correctly, the entire time they were in the wilderness, they would have said, we don't care about the promised land because we've got the promised sir with us. Literally, God's presence is manifest amongst them in the pillar of fire and the pillar column of smoke. If you remember in the book of Genesis, we've seen these, um, these images before. Back in Genesis 15, when the Lord promised Abraham, I'm going to send your descendants into slavery for 400 years, then I'm going to bring them up out of that land into the promised land. And the way in which the Lord ratifies that promise is he brings down a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch, i.e. smoke and fire with Moses or with Abraham right in front of him. This is who I am, and this is what I'm going to do. And now, in not in Genesis 15, in Exodus 14 and 15, now God, that column has gotten bigger. The fire has gotten grander. It leads an entire people. The Lord saying, "I am true to my promise, and I'm with you." What the Israelites should have seen and what they should have said is, "Who cares if we spend?" 4,000 years in the wilderness, God is with us. And he's the only thing worth having and worth wanting. He's here, so we don't need to go anywhere. He's with us. That's enough for me. I don't need the promised land. I need the one, I need the promiser. I need the one who gives the land. God has not come to bring you to some place, to some destiny to drop you off. The Lord has come to bring you to himself. He has not come, as we said before, not to come to give you his stuff. He's come to give you himself. And what he's saying in this text to the Israelites, what he's saying to you is, whatever wilderness you find yourself in, he's with you. And if you know that he's with you, that's enough. Come on, Pharaoh. Come on, Red Sea. Whatever it is, the Lord is with me. If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his only son but gave him up for us all, how shall he not freely with him give us all things. Namely, the Lord is with us. We have nothing to fear. And even if he never takes us to where we think we belong, if he's with us, we're right where we belong. Does that make sense? The Lord says that to them. The Lord says that to us. We learn like the Israelites learn. This is how the Lord leads us. What appears to be incredibly inefficient, unproductive, dangerous, scary, and illogical, when we see the Lord for who he is and treasure him above all things, we realize it is not scary at all. We can have in that moment perfect peace. It isn't inefficient. It's incredibly efficient because he's the God of the universe. It's wonderfully productive because we're with the one who is productive through us and among us. It's not illogical. It's supernatural. It is the way in which the Lord leads us. So if you find yourself in a season where you feel like the Lord is wooing you with his words, and every single step you take to follow him, it seems as though things are falling apart behind you or all around you. Just know this, that is oftentimes the way in which he works. Because he is trying to establish for you that he is unlike any other king or king, any, and runs the kingdom unlike any other kingdom you've been a part of. He is above it all. He's not only revealing his holiness, he's revealing your unholiness and your stubbornness to show you that you're not deserving of the grace that he gives you. He's not leading you to some place. He's leading you to himself. My encouragement to you is to trust him. And one day, in this life or the next, you'll look back and say, I should have trusted you all along. You know exactly what you were doing and why you were doing it. Empower us, O oh Lord, by your spirit to do just that. And we will uh, jump into some worship.
Sovereign Father, who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God, I thank you so much for the stupid Israelites and how we are just like them. Lord, I thank you for how kind you are to reveal to us through them that this is oftentimes how you lead us in a way that doesn't make sense to us in order that we might see, as your text says, your thoughts are not our thoughts, your ways are not our ways. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so are your thoughts above ours. I ask that you empower us by your spirit to not reduce you down to humans 2.0, to think that your ideas and our ideas can contend with one another. Lord, just empower us by your spirit to do as Moses says, to have faith, to stand still, to trust God, and watch him work salvation on our behalf. Empower us by your spirit to trust you well in the wilderness. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.